Good morning, everybody. Where everybody's joining, I'm just going to sit here and wait for a few minutes. Not a few minutes, wait till the top of the hour and then we'll get started. There is an agenda for today. Hey, I'm getting questions early. Um, I've got to switch to another screen and let you know, and I will just include that as um, part of the things I cover when I go through the write-up for it. Oop. write up for it when I do the introduction. Let's go ahead and get started. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so glad that you joined us. Today is actually day two of the webinar. Yesterday was day one of this multi-state webinar. And just to cover a few housekeeping rules, I see that chat is already up and running and um, so you are automatically muted. You can send some information either through chat or through the Q&A boxes. Um, all of these sessions will be recorded. So there, um, as the recording is taking place and then the slide decks, that's all going to be sent to you afterwards. It comes from, hold on, I'm sorry. It's early in the morning and I'm stumbling over my words already. Um, so this information will come to you from Jeff Summer. So after this webinar, you will see that information come through. And then there's also going to be a short survey afterwards. Um, today, what we are going to be talking about, let me just pull up the agenda so you have me. Hi, I'm Amy Graham. I am going to be talking about price transparency. And then after price transparency, I will be handling handing it over to my colleague, John Downs, who's going to be talking about strategic facilities planning, evaluating facilities needs through a strategic lens. And then John is going to hand that over to Claire and Jeff, who are going to talk about lessons from the field, operationalizing the rural value proposition and existing potential partnerships. So that will happen at, um, and I am going to, that's going to happen 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central. And if you're in the mountain range, I think that's now nine o'clock mountain and eight o'clock Pacific. Wow, I did time zones this morning. <laughs> so anyway, and then after that, we will hear a presentation from Eric Shell, who is doing organizational values, culture and management impact. So um, I just wanted to tell you what's gonna happen and we'll just hand that over to one another. And then from there, I just want to talk a little bit about Stroudwater. Stroudwater has been in business since 1985. And since 2017, you can see that we have represented representation of projects that we've done in all 50 states. So if you're wondering, do we operate in your state? Do we not? Yes, we do. And what we like to do as well is to share the learnings from across the United States with you you know, not just saying this is what's going on in your state, but telling you industry wide what is taking place within Stroudwater, what's taking place in that critical access market, and how that how that impacts things that we're seeing. And you'll see in my presentation today, that's one of the areas that I'm doing is just with talking about price transparency. And then we also have an affiliation with our Stroudwater Capital Partners Group. They have been um, working with us and they are providing financing. Uh, our colleague, Brian Hoppala, spoke yesterday about financing opportunities and what that looks like for just building new capital and that tapping into that USDA funding and those type of resources. 
Stratwater, I know uh, you're seeing a brief insight as to what we do and some of the information we're sharing today are just from key learnings throughout the country that we've had. But we do have a strategic advisory as well as an operational advisory practice. So we are taking that information and share it with you so you can see the different areas. Feel free to shoot me a note or uh, put it in the Q&A and one of our facilitators will answer that for you. Um, just, you know, if you are looking for some specific information in one of these areas and we'll be more than happy to connect you with um, that the consulting team that manages that piece of it. I call them my friends so we'd be happy to contact you with my connect you with my friends to help you um, just you know address any of your concerns or needs or some of the questions you may have. So with all of that being said, let's get into pricing transparency. Um, again, I'm Amy Graham, a senior consultant here with Stroud water. And really what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about what is price transparency. Um, you may have seen it in the news, heard about it. It's like, what is all of this? Help me understand a little better. And then I'm going to give you some a tales from a small hospital, how to, and they received a violation. So how to address the violation if you see it come across. And then some key learnings about, you know, just pricing transparency and things to take away from this. So kicking it off, what is price transparency? So I like to say that price transparency was put into effect on November 15th of 2019. And that's when CMS finalized the 2020 current year hospital outpatient PPS policy changes and payment rates and ambulatory surgical center payment system policy changes and payment rates pricing transparency requirements for hospitals to make standard charges public. CMS-1717-F2. I'm going to call that pricing transparency just to shorten that down. So it did go into effect on January 1st of 2021. The legislation said it's going to go into effect on January 1st, and it did, even with the pandemic going on. It's required from all licensed hospitals in the United States. So you need to make sure that your hospital does have price, is meeting the pricing transparency legislation. And what it does is it's providing accessible pricing information for services being provided at your hospital or clinics in two ways. The first is a comprehensive machine readable file. So you have a, a file that's out there that machines can come and take and read that. And then there is also a consumer friendly format of shoppable services. Shoppable services they define as being things that can be scheduled in advance. And so, excuse me, there are things that the patients or your consumers are actually going out there to say, I need this service provided, um, like a CT of your head. You need a CT of your head. That is one of the required shoppable services. And they can go out there and see what that cost would be to them. Now, why do we talk about this? Well, failure to comply will result in a civil monetary penalty of $300 per day for hospitals with a bed count of 30 or fewer. So that is critical access hospitals. You have 25 beds or less. That is what um, the fine that you would receive is $300 a day or a penalty of $10 per day per bed for a hospital with a bed count greater than 30. So when thinking about that, um, you know, the, it is a pretty substantial fine that, that could be assessed to you. With this fine, you know, it's, um, people would ask me, Amy, is this going to go away? I will tell you, they are assessing fines. The answer is no. Pricing transparency is not going away. And they are paying attention to critical access hospitals. With the comprehensive machine readable file. So we have this machine readable file. It's like, okay, what is it? What does it need to have? Well, remember back in the day, you had to put your charge master out there on your website. It was required to be posted. So you'd have your chart, you'd have all the items, the charge items, CPT code, and then what you charged for it. Well, this is that only on steroids. <laughs> this is where um, it includes all standard charges for all items and services for all locations operating under a single hospital license. So if you have clinics that are operating under your hospital license, their charges have to be included in this comprehensive machine readable file. It's not just one location that you post, 
You have to post to all of the locations. It needs to be posted on a publicly available website. Can't be just on your internal internet. It has to be out there on the internet so that it's easily accessible without barriers, that it can be digitally searchable so that the bots can go out there and pull the information out. It has to be digitally searchable. It's updated at least once annually. One of my friends out there that received a fine for it was because they had not updated their, uh, didn't receive a fine, but received a notice of violation because they had not updated it within the past 12 months. It must follow a standard naming convention. So there are specific requirements as to how that is. And I'll give that information to you here in a little bit. And then it also needs to contain the following data elements. A description of each item. Okay, check. We had that on the old file. The discounted cash price. That's the charge that applies to an individual who pays cash. So do you have a cash price? That now needs to be posted out there on this comprehensive machine readable file. There's a payer specific negotiated charge. So do you have a contract with specific payers to provide to um, for them to, that are under their beneficiaries? Well, that information now needs to be posted out there on this con comprehensive machine readable file for all of those negotiated charge where you have have signed a contract with a payer, that information has to be posted out there. And then it also needs to include a de-identified minimum negotiated charge and a de-identified maximum negotiated charge. I find that very interesting um, that you have to put both the minimum and the maximum de-identified when in the columns also on that spreadsheet are all of the identified ones. But that's what they ask for, so it seems a little repetitive. But yes, it's out there. The comprehensive machine readable file, there are standard columns that need to be included. However, there is a level of flexibility that CMS gives. They don't say, here's how your form should look. It needs to be in this format. They do say, here are examples of what that comprehensive machine readable file needs to look like. Now, I also talked about the shoppable services file. The shoppable services file is the second file that's out there. And this is one that needs to be done in a consumer friendly format, meaning that, you know, I always look at like if my husband goes and pulls it up, does he understand what he's reading out there? He's not in the healthcare business. And so does he understand what those services are? CMS says that they are, there are 70 codes that you must include on your listing, whether you provide those or not. Like one of those services is um, um, cataract surgery. Well, not all of you do cataract surgery. Another one are colonoscopies. You have to include that out there. So if you don't include those, you have to notate that they aren't included, but then make sure that you get you include additional services out there to get to a total of 300 shoppable services. So, the, so there are 300 shoppable services that you must include. 70 of them are what CMS says you need to do, and then you've got to get to that total. Now, the difference between the comprehensive file and the shoppable services file is that the shoppable services file also includes any associated ancillary charge. So if we go back to the example of a CT of the head, is that a CT of your head with contrast? You have to include that the contrast is there. Does a physician read that CT and charge for it? Whether or not you charge for it or the physician charges for it, that is an ancillary service that is connected with that item that has to be included on this file. It also includes all locations. I was talking about it a minute ago all locations that are operating under a single hospital license. It's posted on your publicly available website. It's easily accessible without barriers, digitally searchable, updated at least once annually. So make sure you have a date on it that says here's the last review date for it. And then uh, some of you may actually use a patient estimator tool. That's an approved option for pr providing shoppable services out there for your for your customers and for your pop, your community. Now, the shoppable services file, very similar to the comprehensive file, it includes a description of each item, 
but it also includes the ancillary services connected with that identified service. There's an indicator of CMS, you know, those 70 CMS items, you have to indicate whether you offer those or not. And then for each of the items that you list that you do offer, you have to include a discounted cash price. Again, the payer specific negotiated charge, the de-identified minimum charge and the de-identified maximum charge. So thinking about it, when's the last time you pulled up your payer contracts to find a fee schedule to go with it? That information has to be included on both the shoppable services file as well as the comprehensive machine readable file. Now I've talked about those files, but I really wanna spend a minute just chat, no, chatting about the hospital price transparency enforcement and how this violation procedure works. So, you know, as recently as April 26th of this year, April 26th of 2023, CMS issued new guidelines as to how they were going to enforce it, that they have stricter timelines and they are going to levy the fines more quickly so that people are participating with pricing transparency and you have it posted out there. The process includes a notice of violation. So the way this works is you're going to get a notice of violation email or not an email. You'll get a notice of violation from CMS and it goes to the CEO or your chief administrator, whoever's name is listed on the license for your hospital, that's who it's going to go to. So they get a notice of violation and you have a 90 day window to remediate it. So you got 90 days to fix it. And then if you don't meet that 90 day remediation of, of meeting their requirements, then it goes into a corrective action plan that goes to that person that was listed before. So your administrator, CEO, it goes to that person to say a corrective action plan must be filed. It has a 45 day submission plan for our 45 day submission deadline to let them know here's what our corrective action plan is and then 90 days to be in full compliance. So if you think about it from the point at which you get the violation to really having it done, you got about a 180 day window but don't push it because hospitals that don't make any attempt to satisfy the requirement, like when CMS goes out there and looks and comes back, um, they're no longer going to issue that notice of violation. They skip that first 90 day window and go straight to a corrective action plan saying you must submit a corrective action plan, must be submitted in writing. And here's what you're going to do to be in full compliance within 90 days. So let's talk about this. I'm gonna tell you this tale of a small hospital. And my small hospital is Allegheny Health. And they did tell me I could talk about this. So um, they know that I'm sharing this information. But Allegheny Health is a 25 bed critical access hospital in Sparta, North Carolina. So they're small, like the rest of you, like the rest of the critical access hospitals are. Their shoppable services offering was posted using a free tool. So they had somebody that called and said, hey, we can do this for you. Just give us your MIT data. We'll post it. We'll have your shoppable services offering. But like many other critical access hospitals are, that are out there, they struggled to identify 300 unique shoppable services because, you know, their limited volume and the limited service that you provide to the patients, they didn't have 300 services that they were providing as part of that remittance process, right? You offer them that you've got 300 on your charge master, but not that are actually being used on, you know, in the past 12 months. So they received a hospital price transparency warning notice from the CMS stating that the hospital was non-compliant. A little bit more about this violation. Now CMS determines how this violation comes about by by three ways, and it was actually written into the legislation that there are three ways that we evaluate your compliance. The first one is auditing your hospital's website. Second one is they evaluate complaints that have been made directly to CMS. And then the third way is they review individuals or entities analysis of non-compliance. So if somebody goes out and is, you know, so CMS is going to go out there, they're going to audit your website. They're going to say, are you in compliance? Yes or no. That's it. Allegheny, let me tell you how this happened with them. They received a notice on a Tuesday in November 
stating that the review of the hospital's website had occurred on the previous Wednesday. That Wednesday was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. The Tuesday was the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. They got the letter. Letter came to the administrator. In that letter, it said, there are specific violations that were provided. And the violations were, they had a violation for not posting a comprehensive machine readable file. And they had a violation related to displaying the shoppable services. Specifically, no consumer friendly listing of standard charges was found. And they were given 90 days to remediate it. 90 days they had during the holiday season, right after Thanksgiving. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, when you get those letters, they cause immediate concern, don't they? Like, number one, uh, who can help us remediate this issue? We've got 90 days, 90 days to complete this project. Uh, how much is it going to cost to get us in compliance to get this all remediated? What's that charge going to be? Can we afford it? How, can we not afford it? Because, you know, $300 a day is a substantial fine for critical access hospitals. So what does that look like? So, you know, immediately everybody's like, oh, what do we do? How can we handle this? What do we need? How can we fix it? So they, you know, a lot of scary steps that happened there and they started addressing it. The first thing they did was we actually had a call that that day that they got the letter on Tuesday, Wednesday morning. We had a call about their um, charge master on a project I was working for them. And they're like, Amy, we need 10 minutes of this call to talk about this letter. And I'm like, I got you covered. We can work with that. So their first steps that they did was they reached out to a partner who's familiar with their facility and pricing transparency. So they were like, Amy, do you know anybody that can do this? And I'm like, uh, don't worry, we can get this addressed. I, you know, I can work with you. I understand what your hospital is, all your different areas and things like that. We'll get this working. They also connected with the Office of Rural Health. So think about it. When they were thinking about how are we going to pay for this, they actually reached out to the North Carolina Office of Rural Health to say, can you help us cover this cost for getting in compliance, this remediation cost? We don't know how much it is right now, but we need to make you aware that we're going to be calling you. And the Office of Rural Health did have resources to help them with that. So that was another just weight lifted off of their shoulders. So they found a partner, they had the weight lifted off of their shoulders, and then they're like, but we've got to do something internally. So internally, they created a task force to support the project. They realized that what they used before wouldn't fit, and they started working on a compliant offering. So with that compliant offering, they created the offer. They had the shoppable services offering where they identified the 300 services that they could use. We did it by looking at both the hospital and the clinic charge masters to identify those services. They partnered with the clinical teams at the hospital to identify the ancillary services that are associated with those items. They analyzed payer contracts, so they pulled them all together in the fee schedule and developed an Excel model to be posted on their website. They leveraged a lot of that same information to help create the comprehensive machine readable file. When they did that, they were able to use the payer specific information, developed a CSV file that was posted on the Allegheny website, and we did all of that in under 60 days. Woo, we were celebrating. It was like the beginning of the year. We had it done. It was posted out there, and we're like, okay, what do we do? Who do we tell? Do we send an email to anyone? Well, the next steps are they waited for the stealth ninjas to return. CMS, there was no one to tell. We got all the information posted. They had to wait. So they waited. And in March of 2023, 90 days from the first notice, CMS performed a second review of the Allegheny website. They determined that the hospital remained non-compliant. The violations that they found were that the comprehensive machine readable file did not include room and board charges, so those lines had inadvertently been left off, and it failure to follow the naming convention specified by CMS. So that naming convention is EIN underscore hospital name underscore standard charges. They had actually used their MPI number underscore hospital name. That did not meet CMS's requirements, so they received that notice of violation on a comprehensive machine readable file. They did not, however, receive any violations on the shoppable services file. 
So they were given 45 days to fix it. And they submitted, they took the file, renamed the file, added the two lines for room and board, saved it in the appropriate naming convention, filed it back out there and submitted the corrective action plan saying, yes, we got it done. It was done by this date and submitted that in. They were actually able to send this in because it tells you an email to send this one to. And then what did they do? They waited for the stealth ninjas to come back because CMS is doing all of this in the background. And so I want to say to you that it's going to happen in the background. If you're going through this process, it happens in the background. And then they issued a compliance notice that said, yes, Allegheny Health was in compliance. So the key learnings out of all of this are that this process of pricing transparency, I would love to say that rural and critical access facilities are exempt, but they are not. You are not exempt. Now, I gave you an example of Allegheny Health. I told you about another one of my friends who missed, who had it because, um, or who received a notice of violation because they had not reviewed it within the past 12 months. And I've got several other friends who have received these notice of violations. And so it's like, yeah, all of my friends are at critical access hospitals getting these notices and we're working through what they need to do. But you know, remember that CMS, they'll give you a lot of flexibility to do it, but there are key elements like file naming convention, omission of the last, you know, review date, remission of uh, ancillary services, room and board charges. Those are things that CMS is pretty particular about. But also remember that you don't have to do this alone that there are partners out there who understand about pricing transparency. There are partners out there who understand about limited resources and that you can reach out to them to say, what can we do to do this? How can we support my facility? Or do you have any resources and you don't have to go it alone? So I just wanna say thank you. You know, I'm coming right up on my time and JD, I know you're out there in the wings waiting to waiting to chat with me, but we got a few minutes to see if anybody has any questions. Feel free to send them through in the chat box or Q&A. Um, Q&A to ask me any questions. Here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. Send me an email, send me a text message. Uh, be more than happy to talk to you a little bit more about what we're seeing in the world of price transparency. And then for some of you, you may be wondering, well, what are those shoppable services? Um, I put an appendix to my presentation. I didn't want to cover them at the time, but here are the 70 specified shoppable services that CMS requires. So you can see you probably do provide a lot of these items at your hospital, but there may be others that you don't because I don't think many people are doing a spinal fusion at a critical access hospital. Although you might, and if you are, um, you probably have an abundance mindset when listening to Eric Schell. And then looking at some of these other services that are out there. Just want to say thank you very much for your time today. I um, appreciate it. I do know that time is a valuable resource. And again, we thank you for the time that you've given just to participate in all of these conferences. So JD, are you out there? I see you're online. There you are. Oh, wait. I am here. John Downs. We call, I call him JD. That's how I was introduced to him. So John, JD. Welcome to the party. I'm going to stop sharing now and let you share your presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Great presentation. Uh, I always I always find it so interesting to to listen to presentations that are outside of my area of expertise. Uh, and revenue cycle is absolutely one of those things that is way outside of my area of expertise. Uh, but I always I always get something out of it, which is fantastic. Uh, hey, everyone, thanks for uh, spending another uh, portion of your morning uh, with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about strategic facilities planning and how we start thinking about uh, the needs that we have in facilities through a strategic lens. Uh, start with, uh, my name is John Downs. I'm a principal at Stroudwater and have been here about 14 years, coming up on 15. Um, prior to that, I was a partner inside of an architectural firm based in Boston, uh, that designed hospitals. And uh, most of our work was with community hospitals and academic medical centers. Uh, I didn't start working with critical access hospitals until I joined Stroudwater. Uh, and now I'd say probably 85% of my work is helping 
critical access hospitals with strategic planning, facility planning, and kind of underlying market analytics. Uh, so today I'm really gonna talk through the, the thing that I started with, which was really about facility master planning. Uh, so a couple of key items for the day. Uh, first, how do we think about planning for 30 years out when the future is unknown, right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen in 2050. That's insane, but our buildings have to last until then. Uh, so when we start thinking about that, we really ask a couple of key questions. Where are we and where do we want to go? Just can we get directionally correct? What's happening in our market today and what do we start seeing happening out into the future? Now, what do we need versus what can we afford? Those are oftentimes quite in conflict. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a process that we use for facility planning, the team and the folks that need to be involved in that discussion, the approach that we take in order to get the right answers uh, early on in the process, and then understand what some of the critical elements to facility master planning are. And finally, there is nothing that can be done without financing, right? No margin, no mission. Uh, same thing happens when we, or sorry, yeah, no margin, no mission. Same thing happens when we think about facility planning. You know, if we don't have the ability to fund an investment in our facilities, then we've got to first deal with that part. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do a whole bunch of planning if we know that whatever we're planning is not going to be affordable. So it starts by understanding where you are. I mentioned affordability and I'll talk about that in just a second, but the capital capacity piece, understand the market that we're serving, our service area, what's happening inside of that market in terms of demographic and utilizations, what are our competitors choosing to do, and where do we have existing assets and what kind of quality are they? So we start with initial capital capacity planning. Uh, before we get anywhere on facility planning or investments, we've got to understand what the sources of capital that are available to us. You know, we may have a whole bunch of cash. And so, you know, I don't have to worry about sources of capital because I've got it all. Uh, we may have very wealthy donors. I did work with a client, a, a very small rural client that happened to have a very, very wealthy donor base, and they funded virtually 100% of their replacement project uh, over the course of a few board meetings. They said, well, what do we need? Okay, divide it by the number of board members, go out and bundle donations from others, come back and we can get our project going. Uh, but we also have to understand where our current financial status is. You know, what has our EBITDA trend been over the last several years? Because if we're going to any kind of a lender, we're going to have to show those types of things. They don't want to know about, you know, the one-off times that we had a good trend or a good uh, outcome and all of the other times we've been losing money. But it's also okay to kind of think about telling the story of how this facility may improve services offered, improve profitability. All of those things can be talked about, but we need to understand what the basic EBITDA trend has been over the last several years. I mentioned cash, but certainly we want to make sure that we've got enough cash on hand and that we can cover our current and our existing debt. Uh, can we take on any additional borrowing? Do we even have that capacity? Or are we so over leveraged today that you know we're really talking about paint and wallpaper uh, for a period of time until we can improve our financial performance and then we can make facility investments. And then finally, making sure that we're matching up that initial capital capacity planning and what we could afford to do, do we have a sense as to what our need for new capital is? Uh, you know, that's really where the master facility plan comes into play. It's starting to think about what is that long-term need for capital, not just from a facility perspective, but all of the other things that take our capital as well. I'll talk a bit about that as we go through this presentation. Across all hospitals, it doesn't matter if you are the most quaternary academic medical center in an urban environment to the most rural critical access hospital with a service area population of 2,000 people, we look at these same four levers to figure out what it is that we need from a provider, from a facility, from a space perspective uh, across all of the different services that we offer. Starts with the population. We then look at the rate with which that population utilizes services. Those two things come together to give us, this is the total expected volume inside of the market. The third lever, the market share, that's the piece that we capture today 
or that we intend to capture in the future. Sometimes we may say, you know, I'm not interested in capturing any of that. I'll use Amy's example earlier about, you know, spinal fusion in a critical access hospital. I think there was also a cardiac valve replacement on that same sheet. Um, both of those two things, we are likely to say, you know what, we're very happy with 0% market share in those two services. Those should be done elsewhere. Uh, but for those things that we choose to participate in, now we've got somewhere between zero and 100% market share, but we're not the only one that gets to say something about that. Our competitors, our insurers are also kind of impacting what our potential market share might be. But once we can use that toggle for the market share, we can then say, okay, if we were expecting, given a population of 10,000 people and an emergency department use rate of X, we expected to see 6,000 ED visits per year in this community, and we're currently seeing 5,000 of those visits. We've got a very good market share. What would we need to do to be able to get the extra 1,000 visits? Finally, the throughput, that's the part that we can control the most. It starts with what are the days that we're open per year? Right? Of course, in the emergency department, that's a 24-7 operation. But if we think of diagnostic imaging or for those places that provide procedures, oftentimes those are not running 24-7. You know, certainly x-ray and CT would run 24-7 for the emergency department. Uh, but if we were thinking about ultrasound, perhaps that's something that's only Monday through Friday. Or if it's procedures, maybe that's Monday through Friday or it's only two days a week. When we start thinking about the opportunity to expand the hours available or the days available, that increases our capacity without necessarily having to increase our physical capacity, if that makes some sense. So we understand those four levers. We go back to the beginning and really think about what is the service area that we're providing care for? Is it something that is defined at the county level or the district level, or did the hospital themselves get to define what their service area is. We then ask the question, in that service area, are we the dominant provider? Now, as smaller rural hospitals, we are often not going to be the dominant inpatient provider. So again, I go back to that example of the emergency department to say, is there something where we can look at our ER volume, our expected, e the market expected ER volume, and see if we're the dominant provider there? If we're not the dominant provider there, then that raises the question of whether or not the service area is actually correct. Uh, next, should we subdivide the service area? You know, even in smaller communities, it's okay to say, my service area is this, but I want to separate that into an east and a west or a primary and a secondary because we want to be able to make sure that we're understanding what the needs are of any one of those individualized service areas, but it's also really important to make sure that those are not overlapping, right? They kind of butt up against each other. They don't overlap so that I don't have the same zip code in two different service areas. Each time I'm expecting to get 55% market share, but I've now calculated 110% market share because we can't each get 55%. We also ask during service area analysis, who does the project benefit? We're starting to think of putting a clinic out into another area of our community, maybe that expands our service area because it's now benefiting a different portion of our population that perhaps our main campus wasn't benefiting. So we wanna look at all of those things. And once we do, once we understand that service area, then we want to understand what the demographics inside the service area are. What's our population today and what's projected to happen in the future? What is the age distribution? It's gonna be a lot different in terms of utilization if we have a population that is massively growing in the 65 plus age cohort and not seeing much growth in the zero to 17 age cohort. Are there special groups that we need to think about? You know, oftentimes in rural communities, I've found that there are uh, sometimes universities that might be nearby, perhaps not right inside of the community. And that might add another three or four or 10,000 people that aren't necessarily captured in the primary service area because their insurance is actually wherever their parents might be that have sent them to university in that particular area. Another one is uh, prison populations, oftentimes on the outskirts of a service area. But if we're providing care for those special groups of folks, we need to make sure we're providing the capacity to be able to do that. Uh, what's happening in terms of the underlying market dynamics uh, inside of the area, are we seeing 
a new plant come on board? Are we seeing uh, a new mine come into play? And really, where do we see health equity as part of this? You know, oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, we've looked at kind of our demographics in terms of the people that come into our door, as opposed to the people that might live within our community, but aren't able to get in through our doors. And so we've got to think about utilization and access Access for those folks as well, so that we can improve health equity across the country. The next lever, really looking at that utilization of existing services or of healthcare services in our market, we start with our existing volumes, both on an inpatient and on an outpatient perspective, and try to break those down into service lines so that we can start to compare that which we're doing today versus what's expected to be seen inside of the market and then calculate our market share so that we know today we're at 33%, there's a lot of upside growth potential, or we're at 95%, we're capturing all of the ultrasound volume inside of the market. There really isn't an opportunity for us to grow that any further. Understanding how folks are utilizing services today and what's projected to happen in the future is a key lever in projecting facility need. Competition is another big one. And historically, it was always kind of the hospitals, other hospitals we were competing with. Even as smaller rural providers, we were worried about what was getting sucked out of our communities and going to the academic medical centers or the community hospitals that are nearby. Then we started to see providers get involved in that, where providers were setting up imaging centers, surgery centers, and the such, perhaps taking some volume out of the hospital. Well, now we're starting to add a whole other layer of competition in there, and that's really the retail marketplace. Uh, you know, whether it's the Walgreens, CVS, Walmart folks that are doing that via bricks and mortar, or it's virtual offerings that are happening on cell phones, on computers, those types of things are competition for some of our services, and they may impact what we need from a facility planning perspective. We start to think a little bit about facilities when we say, where are our existing assets? Now we know we've got our main hospital campus that's gonna have our acute care. It's also likely going to have some ambulatory care. It'll definitely have ancillaries and support to run that engine. Maybe it has a nursing home also, but that's all kind of confined to our main campus. We also have to understand where are our offsite locations today you know, do we have practices? Is it just an individual practice? Do they have any ancillaries like lab or diagnostic imaging? Or might they grow into that at some point in the future? When we think of facility master planning and we think of the total volume expected inside of our service area, that doesn't have to all be born at the main campus. We can look at how we start to distribute some of those things throughout the community. Of course, we have to balance kind of efficiency you know, it's certainly easier if we can just have everybody come to one place, but also access. Do we lose people if they have to come to the main campus when instead we could offer something closer to their home? Now we start thinking about the future. We've really talked historically or up to this point in the presentation about the past or the present, but now we're starting to think about what's happening in the future. Where do we start to make our directionally correct guesses about what the future market might look like? Uh, do we have a different strategic vision for our organization and who we might want to be? And then finally, after we've set that vision, after we've understood what the future market might look like directionally, of course, not with any great level of precision, how do we make sure we've got the facility assets to meet those needs at the point in time and in the place that our community needs to be met? So when we think about what's happening in the future market, uh, really that starts with changes in utilization. You know, I know that we've been talking for uh, years and years about the coming downslide of inpatient utilization. You know, we're gonna see more folks admitted to observation. We're gonna see more folks cared for at home. We're not gonna have any beds anymore. Well, I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of that has kind of been overestimated in terms of this massive shift away from any inpatient care, but it certainly has been realistic. We've seen across the country in virtually every market kind of continued declines in inpatient discharges per thousand people. If we think about smaller rural communities that typically have lower acuity discharges than their urban academic medical center counterparts, those patients with lower case mix indices, are, we're seeing even further declines or even greater declines 
in inpatient utilization among those because those are the first, first patients that are shifting to outpatient care, to observation care, care at home. Outside of beds, though, we start to think about what some of the technology shifts are and how virtual care is starting to decrease the amount of bricks and mortar that we need, perhaps, to be able to provide the care for our community. If I can get someone to do their office visit while sitting at home at, on their couch, and I don't have to have an exam room for them, that decreases the amount of overall volume that I would see in that clinic practice, decreases the amount of exam rooms that would need, that would need to be there. The other piece to think about in the future are the changes in market share. Our existing competition perhaps isn't going to sit idly by as we make investments in our future. They may still want to get a piece of something. And then do we have the opportunity for new entrants coming into our market that may drive down our volume? Sometimes when we see those changes in existing competition or new entrants, that may push us even faster or even further into a facility investment because those become the new table stakes. You must have X in order to attract this volume. If I don't have a procedure room that is modern, I'm not going to get a provider to do the procedure there. They will do it someplace else or they will build their own. So we really have to think about all of those things as we begin to do our master facility planning. Does our strategic vision change in the future? I mentioned earlier kind of where are we, where might we want to go, but do we have a different geographic service area? Are we offering something else uh, beyond our main campus? Are we adding service lines? Oftentimes one of the big things uh, when we get onto uh, a campus, particularly an older uh, critical access hospital campus, is they may have stopped doing procedures a long time ago and they're interested in getting back into GI or we want to do cataracts or maybe we're going to do some minor ortho. And so thinking through, that's our vision. Do we have the facility to be able to do that? Can we get the providers into our organization to be able to do that, whether employed or aligned? Can we get them to occupy space inside of our facilities so that we can meet our community needs closer to home? We do some volume projections of what that future might look like. Again, looking for directionality. Do we understand that the future volume is 10,000 and 10,000 things will require five exam rooms? I'm making these numbers up just as a, as a point of information. At the same time, if, or let's say it's a, let's use a better example, let's use a CT scanner. You know, if I can do 8,000 CT scans in one scanner, and I can do 6,000 CT scans in one scanner, and I can do maybe 9,000 CT scans in one scanner. If the total market volume is 9,000, and I'm doing 4,000 today, I still need one CT scanner. If I do 400, I still need one CT scanner. So it's making sure we start looking at those volume projections and narrow down where our decisions need to be made and where it's just, are we in the game? Are we not in the game? And if we're in the game, market share doesn't really matter. Once we start getting into the facility planning process, there are a couple of key steps that we want to walk through. First, involve multidisciplinary stakeholders and try to make it a rapid process. We don't want this to be a six month long process of master facility planning because frankly, while that would be incredibly expensive from a consulting perspective, it's probably more expensive for your own time on the hospital side because you've got a day job. Your day job is to continue providing care for your community and all of the things that that entails. My day job is to provide master facility planning services. And so you're balancing two things. I'm only doing my one thing. If we can do that more rapid so that the administration, the providers, the other stakeholders in the process can get in and get out and have an answer quickly, that's got significant upside. We identify our facility priorities and our financial abilities that we talked about earlier, understand the market today and in the future from a volume perspective, look at both short and long-term options at a facility master planning level, but be able to fast track immediate projects. And I'll talk about this with a bit more detail uh, using an example from a client out in Wyoming. You know, We want to be able to respond if someone calls up and says, hey, I've got this issue in my emergency department, I need to make an investment, I need to fix something, that's great. There's nothing to say, we have to wait six months to do a long detailed study, but I certainly want to make sure that that emergency department plan, addition, whatever it might be, fits into a long range framework. The last thing we can, we just can't afford to throw good money after bad. I can't afford to build an addition 
and then find out later, oh, well, that now requires that I'm going to bring these services over here, or I have to knock this down in order to uh, do something in the future. An example I often use, I was working with a client uh, in another region of the country, I'll leave them out for a moment, it's a larger hospital, it's a community hospital, and they had a massive problem in their emergency department. They knew they needed to expand it, and you know they were probably doing again larger hospital. They were probably doing forty or fifty thousand ED visits. So we said, okay, great. You know, here's what we do. You know, probably expand right over here. So just take this parking garage down, and that's where the emergency department will go. We said, well, we just opened that parking garage six months ago. Okay, so now we know that we can't knock that down because the board would would not be happy about it. But the bigger problem for them is that to relocate their emergency department someplace else meant diagnostic imaging had to go with it. And they needed to get to the elevator core to get up to the beds that were on upper floors that were above the existing emergency department. All of those things, because they didn't do a master plan before the parking garage, caused them to spend a lot more money to fix their emergency department in the long run. So we have to make sure we've got that long-term facility framework and phased investment. We can often not, especially in today's financial climate, we can't always afford to do everything all at once. So we want to make sure that whatever we're doing today fits into a framework, but we can take bite-sized pieces that build us towards what we're eventually looking to do. And finally, make sure that especially as critical access hospitals, we're building out a pro forma financial model that includes the impact on the Medicare cost report. If we do that, then we've got the ability to get some of our investment recouped uh, through, through Medicare. Talked about those broad perspectives. It's not just senior management and medical staff. We need to make sure that we're involving the board in the community because we may be looking to them for donations or for tax levies and those types of things. We want that support. Departmental leadership and patients also bring that broad perspective. And it's not just for project planning. It's not just choosing you know, do we like this layout or do we like that layout? Do we like this color palette? Do we like that color palette? At the very earliest stage, understanding what our master plan is, it's important to have all of those perspectives. Uh, a term that I've used for many years now is to be careful scratching today's itch. Uh, and that's the example of, you know, the itch at that particular hospital I was mentioning, they needed parking at some point and decided that was their itch and they scratched it they happened to scratch it and cause them a lot more problems because then they weren't able to expand their emergency department. So we've got to have that long-term plan based in the market analysis, understand our facility assets, and then ask ourselves a couple of things. What will today's project do to my future flexibility? If that client with the parking garage happened to ask that question, the answer, does it doesn't require me to answer it, but the answer from someone in the room would likely be, hmm, the emergency department wouldn't be able to expand over there. Would we ever want the emergency department to expand over there? Hopefully someone would say yes, that's where it should naturally go. But you know, if we at least ask the question, we have a chance to be able to do it. And that final bullet, where must I not put a building? That's equally important because sometimes, and I'll use that same parking garage example, I would have sent a drawing over that put a big red X there and said, nothing goes here. That's the future site of your emergency department. We just did this a few years ago for a client out in Michigan. Uh, they had a plan for another physician building on their campus. And we said, well, understand that that's where eventually the beds will need to go. And so don't put anything there. If you need to have someone talk you off the ledge in that regard, uh, reach out to us. Um, here's my phone number. Uh, and we'll explain why, or just leave it for the next generation of leaders, and we'll explain why to them. Uh, when we think about smaller hospitals, adjacency considerations are absolutely critical. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we've got three key entrances. We've got an emergency entrance. You know, we certainly have that. Uh, we've got our main entrance where people are coming into the hospital for visiting. They're coming in for ambulatory. They're coming in for outpatient. Uh, and then we've got our support, kind of back of the house entrance. And maybe there are, you know, a bunch of others. Uh, it's not a good thing to have 75 different exterior portals getting into the building. Uh, but as few as we possibly can, uh, understanding that the ED is the epicenter of most of your organizations. You know, most everything is going to touch the emergency department. We need to be able to get from the ED to diagnostic imaging. We need to be able to get from the ED to beds. We need, if we have surgery, we have to get the surgery, our supports has to be able to get to the emergency department, but we can't afford to necessarily duplicate things. So, you know, I also want to protect 
cross traffic. I don't want someone from the emergency department going for an x-ray, but having to go through the main lobby of the hospital in order to do that. And we did have that uh, a few years ago with a client out in Nebraska, uh, where to get from the ER to CT, they were going through the main lobby of the hospital. Uh, that's not a great thing. Once I'm in the CT scanner, it doesn't matter you know, if I've run into other folks that are also in in Johnny's or you know, gowns or whatever it might be. But when I'm in the public sphere, when I'm out in the main lobby, I shouldn't be seeing someone else that's you know, either in a state of incapacitation or on a stretcher uh, or in a gown or those types of things. We want to try to eliminate that cross traffic as much as we can. Um, one example, uh, just to kind of point out how we have to do this quite rapidly, uh, clients out in Wyoming, they had a significant issue in their emergency department. They knew that they needed to expand it. They were planning to kind of go out laterally. They were trying to do it with CARES funding. We said, all right, well, understand if you go out to that area where the ED is, we've still got this issue of crossing public traffic to get back to our beds. So can we think about something long-term that would still let you scratch today's itch of the ED, but do it in a way that understands the long-term needs. So instead of going horizontally, we came down, we looked at an opportunity long-term to expand an inpatient unit so that we wouldn't have to cross public traffic. Again, not for today, but this gives them the master plan for the future. Um, it's also important to think about them from a phase perspective. The ED was that first project. You know, We're doing that with CARES funding. They then had a few other things they wanted to do, a kitchen, a lab project, a surgery project, all of which were in flex space, areas that were not going to impact any other departments, and they were good long-term investments there. Beyond that, things that they didn't necessarily know that they needed today, but might sometime in the future, they were looking at potentially a clinic expansion project and that inpatient expansion project that I mentioned. Those are key elements for a master plan. It's not a project plan. It's not solving just today's itch, but thinking about how do we deal with our long-term potential needs, even if we can't necessarily quantify them today. Uh, almost towards the end of my time, I would say master planning is the time for conservative budgeting. Uh, do not underestimate during master planning uh, because it's just going to come back and bite you later. Uh, construction costs per department square foot uh, we are seeing projects now all in between the construction cost and the soft costs of upwards of $1,000 a square foot. Uh, that plus increased interest rates are making financing costs even more challenging. Again, master planning gives us a sense of what that big picture might be. Then we can define those smaller projects that give us bite-sized pieces towards the whole so that we can get there eventually. Uh, Want to make sure we're building realistic financing scenarios. Uh, understand, as I said in the beginning, the cost report impact. Uh, make sure that if we've got financial reserves, we're not spending them all on a project, uh, but making sure that we maintain some of those reserves. Fundraising with a vision. I find that master facility planning is really effective for fundraising because the board, the community, the organization can all look at something and say, aha, I see where they're trying to go. Now I'm going to make my donation. I'm going to support the taxes. I'm going to support all of these things. Folks don't want to bet on a losing horse. And with a plan, we can show that our horse is going to be a winning horse. And then if needed, we look at debt capacity. It's important though, when we think about capital planning, that it's not just the facility planning that we get to spend our money on, right? There are a whole bunch of other things that we're going to need. If we have any older buildings, we're not replacing everything, then we're going to have ongoing expenditures for those. The roofs are still going to go and infrastructure is going to need to be replaced. Equipment is going to need to be replaced. And I mean, if we think of one thing that's equally expensive to facility planning, oftentimes it's an EMR. I don't know how many times I have clients that say, well, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I also have this $20 million that I'm gonna to have to spend eventually on an EMR if I don't have a partner. Um, when do you need to start your capital process? Again, I'd start it in the very, very beginning and let it progress its way through the overall, uh, through the overall master planning process until you can start to dig into the specific components of how do we start looking for lenders, whether it be local banks or USDA or other types of things that I know uh, Amy mentioned, our colleague Brian Hoppla gave a chat, with, chat about yesterday uh, relative to some of those funding sources. So if we bring it all together, we are gonna begin from a strategic perspective, right? We wanna think about what the market looks like today and what it might look like in the future, understand how that impacts a long range facility plan, right? Bite-sized pieces to get us to the eventual 
solution and make sure that while we're doing that, we're ensuring a sustainable financial future. There unfortunately have been some folks out there that have built replacement hospitals or massive investments in their facilities and then have closed because they didn't have a sustainable financial future. So it's really important to kind of build those things through and start to look at what might be able to go wrong, what might go wrong there um, so that we can make sure we remain, uh, we remain viable. Uh, that's the end of my time. Um, certainly, uh, I think I've got a yep, contact information. Um, so, you know, any questions, I know this will come out uh, in terms of uh, slide deck from Jeff uh, out to all of the participants. But if you do have any questions, uh, if something resonated or didn't, feel free to reach out uh, to me and I'm happy to, to chat about those things. Uh, now, I, I'm hoping that my colleagues, Jeff and Claire are, uh, there's Claire Kelly, excellent. Uh, so, oh, and there's Jeff, look at that, fantastic. Jeff, I'm glad you got dressed up. Um, so uh, Jeff and Claire are gonna share some of the best practices and lessons learned uh, that they've really picked up in the field around the value proposition that rural providers, right? It's not, it's not just the big academic systems that get value out of things. This is about the value that you all provide for existing and prospective partnerships. This is super interesting. This one I've seen a couple of times already, uh, and I'm I'm really passionate about about making sure that we're valuing uh, the rural provider in this equation. So uh, with that, uh, Claire and Jeff, take it away. Thanks, JD, uh, very much. And and one of the things I, I just would say before we we plunge into our topic, I think part of the value proposition that I've seen you bring to client engagements is making sure that whatever facility is being planned is grounded in the market reality, that it's not something that's that somebody's really compelling vision, but it's not feasible. And um, I think that's part of the power of what you bring and, and some of the steps you've outlined bring to um, the equation when you're planning a facility. So thank you for your, your insights, JD. Thanks. With, uh, with that, um, Claire and I wanted to spend a little time with you talking about uh, the pros and cons and the um, potential benefits and pitfalls of, of partnering, specifically with the lens of uh, what we think is an undervalued um, aspect of the uh, healthcare delivery system, rural healthcare uh, providers. And so uh, you can see our contact information there. Um, and um, I just wish I was more photogenic is really what I, all I have to say about this slide. So um, starting out, is there a systemic undervaluing of rural health systems and rural affiliates? Our experience working with large systems and working with independent rural health systems that are looking to explore partnering opportunities says yes. Um, we've seen this fairly consistently. And it's not necessarily coming from a place of malevolence or uh, anything ill-intentioned. I think it's just a fundamental misunderstanding or lack of understanding around what are some of the, the value drivers in rural and um, how might a partner capitalize upon those. So our experience, one of the things we've seen is a large multi-billion dollar, very sophisticated system with significant rural operations, missing out on eight figures of, of payment opportunity via flawed designations and alignments within its rural um, assets. Uh, another example is we've had, um, again, another large multi-billion dollar system look at the value of incremental referrals from rural affiliates and fundamentally undervalue them because they're applying a much too high ratio of variable costs. And what that has the effect of doing is greatly diminishing the contribution margin and the value of an incremental referral when they're thinking about that. So the result of that is they fundamentally undervalued what their rural affiliates were bringing to the table, which, which really was, was, in our opinion, harming the system in addition to their rural affiliates. Um, as it relates to partnering, we see this play out in terms of having too few options and having the terms reflect, uh, not reflect the value proposition that, that uh, folks uh, bring to the table, the rural folks bring to the table. And that second bullet there where you, Claire and I started working with a rural health system, 
looked at the initial LOI and were aghast. Um, it was literally something you'd you'd propose if if somebody was was unable to make payroll. And this was a a successful, thriving um, rural health system that yes did have some challenges, but was cash flow positive, had a decent balance sheet, and could be really accretive to that system. So we were able to. Uh, enhance those terms very significantly once we were able to engage with that prospective partner. But the end result is we think decisions are being made um, based upon flawed information. Again, I don't think it's it's ill intent. I think it's flawed information and perspective and perhaps a lack of insight. And so hence the power of really understanding the rural value proposition. So the, the implications of this are significant underinvestment, disinvestment, suboptimal performance, leakage of referrals um, from rural affiliates because they haven't optimized service delivery between the system and the rural uh, affiliate um, and, and really missing out on opportunities. Uh, we've talked about partnership terms not representing the value. Um, and um, again, the, the range of partnering options not being representative of the value that a rural affiliate brings. All of those are very significant drags on rural health care. Claire, you want to take us away with the industry context? Yes. Yes. So to set the stage and kind of what's going on in the healthcare industry, one of the major things we tend to look at are the three most prominent rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, and S&P. These rating agencies publish twice a year what the outlook for the not-for-profit healthcare sector is going to look like. So they publish in December typically and in July or August. As of December, which is their most recent publication in December 2022, um, all three projected that the not-for-profit healthcare sector would be negative or deteriorating in the future. So this is really driven by three things. One is labor shortages, which I'm sure many of you on this call are experiencing or know others that are experiencing it. The second is supply chain disruptions. A lot of this caused by COVID-19 and COVID-19 surges. And all that's really adding to increased expenses where revenues are stagnant or deteriorating. So your margins are compressing. And that's what's really driving these predicted outlooks, as well as you're not getting the COVID-19 relief funding that you were getting in 2020 and in 2021. We also need to look at what's driving affiliations in the past 15, 20 years. So this table on our right here shows the number of transactions from 2005 to 2020. And you can see there has been an increase in those folks that are partnering. Now, the reasons for their partnering and the catalysts that are driving this could be its own separate webinar, but we won't go in depth into that today. We'll touch on a couple. The first is Margin pressure, what I just referenced earlier, where you've got increasing expenses and revenues are very stagnant. You've got a staffing crisis, so it's not just providers who you're having trouble recruiting and your MDs, your NPs, your PAs. It's your front desk staff. It's your facility staff. It's you know um, your RNs. You're having trouble staffing just the rest of your hospital. And we have economies of skill. And what we mean by this is really the education and the knowledge of what it takes to be in rural. Rural is a very complex and dynamic environment, especially in, in the healthcare sector. So having uh, folks that are educated and know what's going on and the regulations that are in place for rural in larger leadership positions is sometimes more difficult to find. And then we have increasing regulatory scrutiny. So what we mean here is that you have um, in the past year to two years or so, we've seen enhanced scrutiny from the Federal Trade Commission or FTC when it comes to larger hospital transactions and acquisitions. So a couple quick examples are Methodist Love on Air was backed to buy um, two tenant owned hospitals, but didn't um, due to pushback from the Federal Trade Commission. You had the same thing happen in New Jersey, where you had Hackensack Meridian Health, which is a larger health system, and Inglewood Health. Um, they were challenged by the FTC and didn't merge. And in New Hampshire, you had Dartmouth Health and Granite One Health, and Granite One Health was a three-hospital system, two of which are critical access hospitals. 
they had the New Hampshire Attorney General opposed to that merger due to it violating the state's constitution for free and fair competition in the trades and industries. So we are seeing enhanced scrutiny. Now, we will say that for some smaller transactions, so if it's a um, critical access hospital with a larger partner, those are less likely to come under scrutiny. But what it asks us to do is really make sure that value is reflected in the contract of partnerships, that you can point to where there's direct value to your organization if you're a critical access hospital or a larger system partner, is being able to say, here's our outline, here's why we're doing this, here's the value that we're generating. And I'll let Jeff touch on some ways to do that. Thank you, Claire. Well, as Claire mentioned, it's really critical to both be aware of uh, the value and, and really what drives that. And that, that's really the, the point of this slide is to identify kind of inventory, the various mechanisms by which um, rural health systems, and I'm, I'm no doubt many of you are familiar with these, all of them, um, what is less true is the extent to which partners are familiar with these. Um, or if they're familiar with them, really understand how to put them to work um, from a system strategy perspective. And it starts with cost-based payment. If folks haven't been in that environment before, um, and even Claire and I have seen this with uh, CEOs who came out of the critical access hospital environment 20, 25 years ago, but really have not been thinking about cost-based payment and what it means. Uh, and so they're, they're approaching strategic decisions, asking a different set of questions um, that, that aren't based in the reality and the opportunities related to cost-based payment. Um, certainly one of the things that our, one of our colleagues, um, uh, Wade Gallen is seeing and, and Eric Shell as well is tremendous opportunities to optimize the cost report. And so this isn't about, you know, whether the, the um, cost report preparer you know, ticked and tied and checked the boxes. This is almost the equivalent of tax planning. How can you make decisions around either uh, what, what um, investments you buy or what investments you sell and when you sell them to optimize your tax position? Same thing with the cost report. How do you allocate costs and are you optimizing that opportunity? Um, the third one here um, is really an important one. And we've seen a high degree of variability in terms of the degree to which folks are taking advantage of this, the degree to which folks factor the home office cost allocation into their strategic decisions. Um, so we'll share a slide in just a minute that speaks to the magnitude of this opportunity. Um, the last thing I'm gonna speak to um, is the swing bed program and how, especially if it's a CA that's in a, in a geographically proximate area, um, how that can be a real asset for clinical programs in terms of how you manage um, hospital stays and um, caring for certain patient populations. Swing beds can be a real asset for that uh, and, and um, understanding the attributes of that program. So those are some of the, the rural levers that I think folks either underappreciate or don't understand, particularly at larger systems or PPS hospitals, if you happen to be talking to them about some aspect of partnering or an affiliation. So the, another key point to uh, note is in addition to there being um, all those value levers, what we find is there's, there's not an appreciation for how different partners, partnering structures can impact the ability to capture those value levers. So one of the points we would make is as you move to the right on this continuum, you're more integrated. And it, it, it requires more commitment from the parties, but also has the potential to create uh, additional value. However, if the affiliation or partnership is fundamentally structured in a flawed way, and we've seen that happen, sadly, we've spent time unwinding flawed affiliations before, um, either the, the partner wasn't right or the structure wasn't right, um, and it can be really difficult and time consuming and distracting to unwind a flawed partnership. But as you move to the right, there's more commitment required and the potential for more value, but also the potential for more damage if you get it wrong. So starting at the left-hand side where you have, you know, independence moving into some clinical affiliations, which are tactical, targeted, 
and, and um, can realize significant value if you have an aligned partner that has the resources to help promote a, a satellite clinical program at your critical access facility. Those can have real benefit. What they don't do um, is necessarily create the kind of operating risk, operating control necessary to really unleash the home office allocation. And you can see down on the bottom there that that's really reserved for structures to the right that have that level of commitment, that level of risk, and that level of control. The key point of this slide and takeaway is there's a tremendous amount of affiliation structures. And even within a structure, there's a tremendous amount of variability um, in terms of the terms and the requirements. So the last thing I'll say about this slide is the sole member substitution is the most common affiliation structure. It's uh, really solely available to not-for-profit to not-for-profit uh, partnerships or, or mergers. Um, it is, as, as these things go, pretty straightforward. Um, um, and, and again, highly known by regulators and the legal community, et cetera. So it's, it's, there's a certain ease to doing it. Your contracts don't have to be reassigned because the corporate entity remains in place. That being said, there's a huge amount of variability in terms of what prospective partners require or ideally want in a sole member substitution. And for that reason, it can be really important to be able to compare and contrast different partners and different proposals side by side. So certainly if you're looking at different structures from different partners, but even if you're looking at the same structure, being able to compare and contrast is hugely helpful. This is just an example of what we talked about before, the overhead cost allocation. An example from North Carolina where we were doing a study, this shows the overhead costs that were allocated to the CA affiliates cost report. This number would be netted down by the proportion of cost-based payment they received. That's gonna be variable by state, depending upon um, how much um, cost-based payment Medicaid does, and that varies state by state. It also will vary market by market based upon the payer mix, what portion of the market is, is Medicare. But you can see the order of magnitude here, $14 million annually at the high point. Now that would likely be netted down by a factor of, of 50%. Um, realizing about a $7 million annual pickup in cost-based payment uh, and reimbursement. Um, now, there would be some offsetting incremental costs associated with that as the system would provide additional services, but clearly an overall net effect to the system from that overhead cost allocation. So Claire and I like to talk about the world as being um, a very risky place. It's full of risk. It's risky if you are independent, you have operating and standalone strategic risk. And it's risky if you partner, you have partner risk. How do you deal with that risk? Well, if you're an independent organization, you focus on operational performance and sound strategy and good governance and, and um, all the fundamentals, which can be really challenging in this environment to be clear. Um, if you're looking at partnering, and we've broken this into two categories, for prospective partners, you want to make sure you have a strategically aligned partner, you have the right structure that addresses your objectives and mitigates your constraints and risks. Um, you want to have contractually enforceable terms. Um, so eliminate weasel words like we commit to provide up to $10 million in capital over the next five years. That literally means they could give you nothing and still be in compliance with that term. So it's really important to vet the terms and negotiate terms carefully. Um, assessing that partner, I said strategically aligned, but you also want to look at their capabilities. Are they able, do they have the capacity to mitigate your risk profile as a standalone organization? Do they have the clinical programs you need in your, your uh, market? And will they be able to help enhance those, that local service delivery? Do they have capital? Do they have a track record? Uh, of delivering value and community benefit to their rural affiliates. It's a really important concept that Claire and I spend a lot of time talking about when we're working with organizations, community benefit being some very uh, uh, material or monetary components, investment, but some non-monetary components like uh, continued access to core services or enhancing certain services. So really important. For existing partners, the dynamic's a little different. 
You want to make sure, even though you've got a partnership with them, that they understand your value proposition. All too often, as our prior example show, folks don't. You have opportunities to enhance or modify your, your affiliation structure to create a win-win and additional value might be worth looking at. And you want to look at missed opportunities. Um, but it's really important to understand the return on investment, not just for you, but for the system partner. It's, it's uh, one size does not fit all. And it's really important that, that whatever you're proposing be strategically aligned. We'll talk about this a little bit more um, in, a, in a few minutes. So I'm gonna walk us through a couple examples from the field and what we've experienced, you know, as Jeff and I have had some, some time in this industry. So one of the ones we wanna talk about is we were working with a critical access hospital and they retained us because they were in negotiations with a large multi-state health system. The contract that they had on the table from that large multi-state health system, you know, had minimal capital commitments and virtually no local role in governance. And, you know, these folks weren't a terrible critical access hospital. They were, they were pretty, pretty great and they were functioning well. They are financially viable. So we went back to the drawing board with this large multi-state health system and found a couple things. The first being the large multi-state health system had valued the home office cost allocation at about 100K annually. Our calculations actually had it valued at 3 million. It should be stated that this large multi-state health system has a great reputation. They are very respectable. They are very smart and, and put together for a health system. They simply just didn't understand the value of rural in this case as it came to the home office cost allocation. Additionally, they didn't calculate in the 50% share of cost-based payment, and they also didn't factor in the modest change in referrals. When you acquire a critical access hospital or a new partner, you're going to have some change in your referral network, and that can generate, generate um, revenue. So once we pointed out these three things and had brought them up and had negotiations with them, the multi-state system went back to the drawing board and came back with a revised contract, and that included major capital investments, um, major service commitments, and a continuing role in local governance for the critical access hospital. So it really changed the conversation between the two, um, pointing out these value levers and, and making them well known. Another example we want to talk about is Stradwater was engaged by both a critical access hospital and a regional referral center, and they did a joint engagement with us because they wanted to look at opportunities between the two organizations. Specifically, they wanted to look at service line operational and clinical opportunities. They wanted to look at swing bed opportunities, potential 340B program opportunities, rural health center or RHC opportunities, and of course, the home office cost allocation. And they wanted to understand, you know, would they be a good fit strategically and what from a high level would the financial benefit of being together look like and how could that translate into um, um, similarities in culture and, and organizational values. So Stroudwater broke this out into um, three kind of views because these two folks had not decided what they wanted to do in terms of an affiliation structure. So we looked at them on an independent level on a limited partnership. So in terms of degrees of integration that Jeff went over, that'd be towards the left of the spectrum and then a full affiliation, <clears throat> which would be more towards the right of the spectrum, your sole member substitutions, your full asset uh, mergers, et cetera. So in terms of service line reassignments, that offered about a 1.1 million pickup um, if they were in a limited partnership or full affiliation for swing bed program growth. Um, if they were independent, it'd be about 140K annually. Limited or full affiliation would be about 100K annually, um, 180K annually, excuse me. RHC and 340B drug pricing program, if they were in a full affiliation, which is really what you have to be into to capture that, that's about a 270 K annual pickup. Um, and the net impact of home office cost allocation, again, as Jeff said earlier, where you have to be towards that right end of the spectrum is about a 2 million pickup. So the annual impact of opportunities that range between independent at about 140 K, because you're really only getting the swing bed program there. Limited partnership was about 1.3 million and a full affiliation was 3.6 million annual pickup. So again, this changed the conversation. It helped lead negotiations as both sides understood the value that could be generated from a partnership. You had the regional referral center that understood what they could what they could uh, bring to the table and the critical access hospital could, could see that, that 
that they had some leverage and an ability to negotiate. Thank you, Claire. Um, and one of the things I would note uh, about that example Claire just shared is the estimate for the um, pickup from, from the overhead cost allocation was already net of the percentage of cost-based payment in this case, and also assumed a, a only 60% of the calculated total, kind of a conservative estimate. So the annual benefit of you know, the focused tactics that Claire just outlined was probably on a, on a maybe a more uh, aggressive or fully loaded uh, example, about 4.5 million a year. And that, that still didn't address other things that were available to them, other value levers that were available to them. So uh, just a, a really interesting, compelling example. So what does this mean then, if we were gonna define a best practice for partnership processes for existing partners? Um, First of all, it's important to focus on a win-win. It's got to benefit both the affiliate and the partner, whatever you're going to do. So it's important to have that mindset. Um, you need to be very pragmatic about it. Um, you don't want to over-promise and under-deliver. You need to establish that, that credibility that, that there is real value in these value levers. Um, we always recommend find an early win or two. Build, build confidence. Get that, those points on the board, so to speak and then you can get buy-in. So in terms of prioritizing and thinking about early wins, you want something that's a low cost or low barriers to implementation. Um, the time for payback, a good ROI that can be realized in a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, An example of that would be taking a closer look at the cost report and making sure the cost report is optimized um, uh, by way of example. There's some lag there, but um, you can do and an, you know file a, uh, an interim cost report, um, and it does. It is you are able to quantify it uh, quite quickly. Um, you want the ability to execute. So something that's really complicated or requires significant uh, additional expertise that may not exist within the system is probably going to be more challenging to get buy into. Uh, again, needs to be a value proposition there to the partner, uh, the affiliate, and the system uh, overall. And lastly, it's important to understand the strategic fit of the opportunity. You don't want to propose something that, yes, might make sense tactically, but is going to create problems strategically uh, for the organizations, for the organization. So important uh, uh, to look at that and really approaching this as an opportunity to educate colleagues. I can say with, with a high degree of, of probability that if you are in an existing affiliation with a larger system, um, it would be a relative rarity that decision makers at the system would have significant familiarity with these levers. Uh, many of the folks have been fully immersed in the, the non-cost-based payment environment for years and have been focused outside of rural in, in many instances, not all. Um, so there can be a, an initial education component to this. For Prospective partners are folks that are thinking about going on a, 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 investigating uh, affiliation or partnership opportunity. It's, it's important that folks compete for the privilege. And it's, there's a pragmatic, uh, several pragmatic reasons for that. One is you want to be able to gather information, aggregate information. What are different people saying about you? How are different people uh, approaching this? And use that in your negotiation. You are going to be the only person who knows um, what everybody is proposing, and you can use that to your benefit. So creating a competitive environment sets up for a successful negotiation um, for you. Um, use the process to educate prospective partners. As I said before, in most instances, prospective partners haven't built these value levers into their mindset and their approach. So understanding which ones are more willing and, and uh, adept at understanding rural uh, is an important consideration. Uh, and so you want to gauge, can they, will they adjust their terms um, for you? Um, you do want to negotiate with, with these in mind and quantifying the terms and indicating, you know, there's, there's real value here and, and it's appropriate that it be reflected in the terms and the community benefit that is proposed. Um, certainly looking at their track record, and one of the things that Claire and I would say is just such a no-no 
don't sign a letter of intent that gives somebody exclusive negotiating rights unless you have an acceptable term sheet in hand. It's the equivalent of going into a car dealership, handing your checkbook to the salesman and saying, write yourself a check for what you think the car is worth and um, I'm fine with that. Don't give somebody an exclusive without knowing exactly what the terms are. So the key takeaways, um, we feel that in many instances, the intrinsic value of rural is missed or misunderstood. And the result is missed opportunities and um, fewer um, options for uh, affiliates. You need to do your homework uh, and educate and engage with prospective and existing partners around these ideas and issues. One of the critical things is to make sure that your house is in order and that um, you have um, your operations are trending in the right direction, even if they're not cash flow positive. Nobody will be willing to engage um, in a meaningful way, or many people will be scared off by an organization that doesn't have a plan they're working and has poor operating results. And again, being able to explain and quantify the value proposition why you bring value. Uh, and really one of the things to focus on is the value of incremental referrals, the value of an aligned attributed uh, set of, of uh, lives is, is really important. Um, but you wanna create that long-term win-win partnership. And lastly, it takes persistence. Um, the, the initial uh, point of education likely won't sink in, it'll take two or three times or longer for it to sink in, even with folks that are receptive. So it takes work and persistence. Um, I think that is about it for our time. You have our um, contact information there. And I know we have um, a couple of questions that we can respond to, and we'll include those responses to those questions um, when we send out the slides. Um, but uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And I want to hand it off to our colleague, um, Eric Schell, who will be joining you and sharing um, some of his perspectives on rural. Um, and Eric is always an interesting and educational uh, speaker. So Eric, are you are you with us? I am, Jeff. And I like your uh, categorization of me as interesting. May you live in interesting not, times, Eric. May you live not in sure if I've heard that before. Um, but anyway, um, thanks. Great presentation. Great great after JD and Amy earlier. So we've got it. We've got a day going on right now. Um, let me let me jump in and share my screen. Um, I have to tell you, Jeff, though, um, I'm sure this was clear as the first time you've ever finished a presentation on time. So um, um, really good stuff. Thank you, Claire, for keeping him uh, in order. No problem, Eric. <laughs> All right. So so here's what we're going to talk about today. Let me just make sure. Is this up and running in the right view? Claire, is it, is, it, is it up and? Yeah, Eric, all set. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, so 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 let's kick off the the um, the cleanup here on today's um, four presentations is around organizational values, culture, measurement, impact on bottom line. Uh, it's a lot of words to explain to you after my 26 years of traveling around rural America, probably visiting 350 rural hospitals. Um, you know, I get questions. I get a lot of people saying, Eric, okay, what is it about the successful hospitals that are different than those that are not as successful? And it's taken me some time to kind of pull that together. And this presentation is really the set of the key, uh, what I consider those attributes of the most successful rural hospitals. And, um, and, and so, you know, kind of with that as a fancy introduction, we'll get into it. A little bit about me, Eric Schell, Principal Chairman at Strawwater Associates, have been with the firm for 26 years. And uh, the, for the most part, the entire time has been um, working with um, critical access hospitals and small rural hospitals. My first day at Stroudwater was the day the Balanced Budget Act was passed in 1997 that, that essentially uh, converted the old each peach program into the critical access hospitals. So um, <laughs> I've had a chance to, to be part of the critical access hospitals my entire career. Uh, 
So, so with that as a lengthy introduction, let's jump into it. I'm going to tip my hand right off the bat and say, you know, what are these three attributes of the most successful critical access hospitals? And, and, and I want to start with this abundance mindset um, to be explained on the next slide a little bit more. Uh, the second is a fundamental understanding of, of the economics of a of a rural hospital, critical access hospital, and essentially what drives profit or, or at least break even. And, and then thirdly, a measurement culture that we, we shine the light on, on performance um, as organizational, as an individual level with data and measurement. Those three in combination are the keys to success of the most successful of the rural hospitals. And then I've got four case studies just to, to highlight uh, some of the those these, these specific attributes. And, and that's what we're going to cover today in the next several minutes. Um, so let's just talk a little bit. I, I like to start with these. These are the values. These are my how I live my life, the four values, how I live my life. And also uh, Stroudwater has incorporated these values as our values. Uh, and I'm going to start with just kind of impact, you know, kind of get up in the morning, trying to figure out how to make the world a better place uh, is the first. The second is interdependence, recognizing we're just a small part in that everything that we do has implications on others. Uh, respect. And, and then finally, abundance. Abundance was coined 34 years ago in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, and to me, this is the number one attribute of the most successful rural hospitals. And because it's so important, I hope you allow me, uh, well, <laughs> if, if you don't allow me, you can just put yourself on mute, but um, I'm actually gonna read from Stephen Covey's page 219 of the Seven Habits book that talk about abundance and contrast it with scarcity. And, and he spends a lot of time talking about scarcity and very little time talking about abundance because to some degree it falls right out. So let me, let me just read six paragraphs uh, from page 219 of The Seven Habits. Ursa starts off with the abundance mentality is the paradigm that there's plenty out there for everybody. Most people, and here's where he's going to talk about the uh, scarcity principle, most people are dip, deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much, as though there was only one pie out there, and if someone were to get a piece of the pie, it would mean less for everybody else, and primarily less for me. Uh, the scarcity mentality is a zero-sum paradigm of life. People with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing credit, recognition, power, profit, even with those who help in the production. They're also very hard time being genuinely happy for the successes of other people. It's almost as if something is being taken from them when someone else receives special recognition or windfall gain. Although they might verbally express happiness for others' success, inwardly they are eating their hearts out. Their sense of worth comes from being compared, and someone else's success to some degree means their failure. Uh, often people with scarcity mentality harbor secret hopes that others may suffer misfortune, not terrible misfortune, mind you, but acceptable misfortune that ultimately puts them in their place. Um, always comparing, always competing. They want other people to be the way they want them to be. They often want to clone them and they surround themselves with yes people, people who won't challenge them, people who are weaker than they. This is the essence of scarcity. And, and what I've found in my travels is so often we allow that this culture to persist in rural. Um, then let me just say the abundance mentality, on the other hand, flows out of a deep sense of personal worth and security. It is the paradigm that there is plenty out there and enough to spare for everyone. It results in sharing of prestige, of recognition, of profits, of decision making. And it opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. That is how Stephen Covey explains the abundance. And as we get into my five case studies, each one of the CEOs of these organizations 
could put their picture next to that term abundance as Stephen Covey has termed it, and, and it would fit perfectly well. And, 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 I, and I, it'll, it'll show you, it'll compare and contrast before and after these new leaders came, uh, came on board. So number one criteria in my mind is this abundance mindset. Oh, an interesting side note is that what I often find is that abundance-minded CEOs, they're, they're often rare because they get taken out. Their interest is in all others, where a scarcity person's interest is in themselves. And that leaves the back of an abundance person wide open <laughs> for a knife to go right between the shoulder blades. And, and so, and, and, and actually in most of the examples I'm gonna show at the end, the CEOs were taken out at some point, most reinstated, but taken out by scarcity. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's my end of abundance. The second is economic philosophy. Uh, the key here is that, that to, to understand that, you know, primarily in our fee-for-service world, that we generate contribution margin from incremental volume. And, and in contribution margin is essentially it's revenue less variable expense. Variable expense, I mean, if we really stop and think about it, if we admit in a patient today at noon, what did our cost just go up from that one additional admission? You know, close your eyes, but not too long and think about that. You know, it's not a lot. It's food, it's pharmaceutical. We didn't change our staffing. We didn't change the, the compensation of the CEO or CFO or CNO. Uh, all of that remained constant. To some degree, those are fixed. So contribution margin is revenue, that incremental volume, $2,500 per day in, on, uh, the, in, on the per diem, less your variable expenses, and let's throw 250 at that, there's significant contribution margin. The problem with variable cost is there's not an accounting system in the world that's set up to tell us what that number is. And here's why. There's a time dimension associated with determining what a variable cost is. In the short term, do we do one more lab test today? If we think about that, your variable costs are pennies on the dollar. It's the reagent cost. Your revenue is easy to measure. That's $20 or whatever your net you know, fee schedule amount is. And your expenses, there, our accounting systems aren't going to tell us what they are. Now, on a long-term decision-making, uh, the, 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 your variable expenses, say a five-year planning period, are, are 100%. You close the entire hospital if it's not working out. And so our accounting systems don't understand what is the basis of time that we're using to make a decision. So here you are with contribution margin as the keys to success within our rural hospitals, but you can't measure a key input to that, which is variable costs. The key to a rural hospital though, is to create thousands and thousands of mini contribution margins to cover the fixed costs that, that, that we incur. Frankly, that combined with an abundance mindset are so important. And here's why. Let's just look at the, you know, if we have volumes across the x-axis, if we have dollars on the y-axis, and let's just look at costs. And we just said costs, we have very high fixed costs. So at zero volume, which is right here where I'm pointing, our costs are here. Think of this as your employee parking lot um, and your patient parking lot at eight o'clock in the morning. Your employee parking lot is full because everybody's come to work. That's fixed, fixed costs with not a lot of you know, new incremental patient activity. But when we have that incremental activity, our costs go up a tiny bit, resulting in a very shallow sloped cost curve. On the other hand, the revenue curve goes is much more steep. And that's because we generate one more lab test. It's $20. The variable reagent cost is a buck. One more patient admission, $2,500 per diem, our variable costs are 250. So what happens is this very steep sloped revenue curve is ultimately going to catch your cost curve to the extent that you can push out volumes. 
And, and so now let's see how that looks. So, so several years ago, I set up a Excel spreadsheet to, to kind of look at this and to run some scenarios around varying volume to look at what happens to costs. And so just a hypothetical, what we assumed is a small inpatient unit, the fixed cost, truly fixed costs were $6 million. Then we assumed variable costs for a, a acute day is 250 and swing bed costs on a per day basis of 150. And so when you model that out, running starting with a census of four, going to a census of nine, you can see that across any unit of volume, there's going to be your fixed cost of six million. And I know that there's someone going to say, well, there's some step, step fixed function in there. And you're absolutely right. But let's just go with this model for now. Fixed costs remain at six million. And then your variable costs go up in total a tiny bit tied to volume at the 250 and the $150 per day. Now, what gets interesting, especially for the critical access hospitals, is your unit cost. Because at the end of the day, you know, Medicare, well, they're going to pay your total cost, but often we look at that from a unit cost perspective. And what we'll see is that when the census is four, our fixed cost, which is the red on a per unit basis, are very, very, very high where our variable costs stay constant throughout at any volume because they stay, they're tied to volume specifically. But what happens is here, as volume grows, we dilute that big chunk of fixed costs over more and more units of service, driving down unit costs. Now, with that in mind, and this is the same for outpatients, the same exact, you could set up the same graph and I have, I just cut it out so we could get through this in 30 minutes. Um, the the um, the uh, the next chart. This is this is the keys to the kingdom from a critical access hospitals perspective in terms of how do you drive profit within an organization. Let me just say that we're you know if we look at the break even point for this inpatient unit, it's right around this point right here. And to say that, let me just say that the blue line going across that's your that's your, your um, kind of your fee schedule revenue per day for an inpatient stay. And we've just assumed it about $1,400. The red line is your cost per day. We, and, and, right, it's, and it's your unit cost per day. So it's this, and as volume goes up, we dilute our, those fixed costs over more and more units of service, which drives down unit costs. The pink line is, uh, is excuse me, excuse me, the red line is your cost-based revenue. The pink line is your total cost per day. The cost per day and your cost-based revenue are one and the same other than a 1% less sequestration. So essentially it's, it's one and the same. Now this unit breaks even at this point and it breaks even at the point where your unit costs fall below the payment from third-party payers or your fee schedule amount. So if you terms of how do we generate profit within a critical access hospital, the strategies become very clear, right? The first thing we do is we use volume to dilute fixed costs, to drive down unit costs to the point where we can make money on our fee schedule revenue. The second thing that we can do is we can renegotiate higher rates with third-party payers, something that's often lax within our critical access hospitals. Um, you know, if we could get a, a $1,700 per diem versus a $1,400 per diem, the break even goes, goes to, 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 you know, five and three quarters rather than seven and uh, seven and a half. And the last is to drop expenses. If you just cut expenses across the board, but what happens there is your cost-based revenue goes down in, in lockstep with your unit cost decline. And so this becomes the key. So, you know, having this understanding of economics coupled with an abundance mindset leads right to something really important. And that's a focus on generating additional incremental volume over what we currently have in our organization right now. And that point right here, efficient, appropriate patient volumes meeting the needs of their service area. Um, revenue cycle, making sure we're getting paid um, you know, kind of as, as best we can. We have a charge master uh, updated on a regular basis. 
We have third party contracts that are negotiated on an annual basis, uh, expenses managed aggressively. All of these are part of that, uh, that last chart that shows. And frankly, the focus on patient volumes, there is not a critical access hospital that I've visited that doesn't have an opportunity to grow incremental volume. When on average, 65% of your volume is driving right by the front door of your hospital, the extent we can capture five percentage points more of that, it results in a 15% increase in volume, improved efficiency, and improved probability of financial, imp financial performance. So some of the things that I've seen out there, um, you know, how do, we, how do we grow incremental volume? The first, I always kind of use this analogy. Um, we like to go from catching to pitching. There's, there's, I'd say a majority of your department managers are catchers using a baseball analogy. They sit behind the office and if the pitch comes in wild or the volume doesn't materialize for the day, they point at the pitcher and say, it's the physician's fault. Where you have one or two department managers, every single one of you has the two, one or two pitcher department managers, and they're the ones that they're out, you know, they're out leading the health fairs, they're running in the 5k races, they're posting their, hey, come see me over the lunchtime on their Facebook. I mean, they are out there in the community. And often what you see is their volumes growing and everyone else's volumes are stagnant. And so, you know, how, how can we, you know, kind of replicate that spirit of the pitchers throughout our entire organization. Some of the greatest opportunities that I see opportunities to manage is ER admissions. If we're not running um, our ER admission rate, when you combine both acute and observation should be between 10 and 12%. That's kind of the benchmark, the target that we set. Um, many hospitals are at or above that, um, a majority are not. Uh, swing bed. Swing bed is one of those services that you, hot, you, you you shine a strategic spotlight on swing bed services. They grow. You take that spotlight off. They shrink. Let's maintain that strategic spotlight the entire time. And then other ancillary services that we just talked about. And then improving the effectiveness of our um, revenue cycle functions. I look at revenue cycle as, as two clear opportunities. One, an effective measurement system. We ought to be driving performance through KPIs, a set of key performance indicators with targets set for each. And, and, and we set weekly revenue cycle team meetings to, to, to address where the target and the actual vary. Um, and then the second part is the supercharging the front end process, online insurance verification, pre-registration for any scheduled services, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that I want to highlight here is this effective measurement system, because this is going to lead into this organizational design discussion that, that um, the third attribute of successful rural hospitals is a measurement culture. And it's not just measurement in revenue cycle. It's measurement culture throughout the entire organization, the quality program, the uh, um, you know, overall keep identifying a set of uh, organizational key KPIs, revenue cycle. It's each department having measurements to understand where they perform. And so it's all couched in this organizational design. And let me explain this because it'll put an emphasis on measurement. So the, the theory around organizational design says it starts, there's a three-legged stool of where we set decision rights, how do we measure performance, and what's the compensation look like? And those are all interconnected. And let me go further to say that let's see in a, in a, in a hospital where decision rights can't, it would be very difficult to centralize all decision rights at the CEO, because at the department level where you're providing services to patients, there's site-specific information that has to be used to effectively, uh, you know, kind of make decisions on behalf of that department and then results in performance at the hospital level. So the extent you have this, these site-specific information, pushing down decision rights is critical. But if we do push down decision rights, the next thing we have to do, and I'm going to jump all the way over to compensation, is we want to reward those. We want to create an incentive program aligned with the organizational goals. Because if we push 100% of decision rights down to those in the front lines, and then we maintain a fixed compensation, 
they don't really have any personal incentive other than the do good of their heart to, um, you know, they're not aligned. Their compensation is not in line to the best interests of the hospital. The third leg of the stool is then measurement, that if we do push decision rights down, which I see in every single rural hospital, if we tweak the compensation, either um, recognizing overall organizational performance in compensation or individual, we've got to get information. We've got to have two sets of information. One is measurement at the department level so managers can evaluate the decisions that they're making and, 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 and do better. The other is that we at the senior level have to be able to assess what's going on down there where we're not front and center making those decisions. So there's performance um, management and performance measurement. And so, you know, this is this whole measurement system increasingly as we've pushed decisions down into the balls of our organization is absolutely critical. So some of the areas that I see are great opportunities. This one, uh, you're going to be like, oh, Eric, you're an accountant. Of course, you're going to think this is important. But this one, I've seen this change the culture of an organization immediately, where management accounting, best practice management accounting, I see is managers are involved in both in the budgets, both from a revenue and expense perspective. Often what I hear from, from you know, CFOs is, yeah, we engage the managers around their expenses and their capital, but we don't really, we just assume volume constant or we just, we plug that. Well, that we lose out on the opportunity to engage our managers in, in kind of what, um, <laughs> what volume should be. And, and again, if 85% of our costs are fixed, Volume's 100% variable. I want more attention to the volume side of that equation. The second thing we do is monthly financial statements with predefined variance analysis sent to all managers. You know, let's set a variance threshold from budget of 10% of both volume and expense. And anything that varies from that, it requires feedback from the manager to the senior team on what's going on. Now that does a couple of things. One, it educates the senior team on what's going on, but it also engages the manager in looking at the budget and paying attention to it. And so, and then the last piece is quarterly departmental operational reviews, where the CEO, CFO meet with the department managers to discuss their individual departmental performance. To me, that is best practice management accounting. We can measure staffing. You know, here Stroudwater set, uh, came up with a set of paid FTEs. I'll give you just one example, and then we're going to move because we're almost out of time here. But med search um, per patient day, we look at 12 paid hours per patient day as a as a standard. Um, this hospital would would uh, given that volume would be at 26 FTEs. They're at 34. They're a little high. Um, and, and, and so each of this, this column right here that I'm highlighting is, is how we look at paid hourly standards for these indicators for these departments. And so uh, I will tell you, though, from an expense perspective, in the 350 rural hospitals that I've helped, cutting, cutting staff has been a recommendation about three times. It's just not that important because if we are overstaffed, we have opportunities to grow services without having to add. Um, physician complement. Here's another one. I'm going to keep moving now. Let me just touch on some of the case studies. Um, this was a case study. A good friend of mine's the CEO. His picture belongs next to that abundance definition in in, in the dictionary or Wikipedia. Um, but but here's just an example of you know, the green line is his his operating revenue. Uh, the red line is operating expense. And the blue line is tied to the Z axis, which is operating margin. Um, I did speak with, uh, he's like I said, he's a friend of mine. I spoke with him last Friday, and he said that this year they're looking at a 15% operating margin. The critical access hospital in the Northeast, abundance focused, incredible relationship improvement with his medical staff. His quality scores are the best in the state that he lives in, that his hospital is in. And it's a measurement. These, these folks, when you meet with them, they come with their binders, they come with their, their manager reports around quality because they're just so passionate around sharing what they are. And again, the best quality scores in the state that they live in. This was a hospital in the upper Midwest. Um, 
former CFO, very abundance focused, engaging all staff in improvement, great relationship with the medical staff. The green line is the revenue, and you can see it's growing apart from the red line, which is expenses, often a good thing or always a good thing in my book. Um, and then operating margin started at zero and improved all the way to 11%. Now, this was back a few years, but um, just extraordinary performance. Quality scores were the best in the region. They were a five-star hospital. Quality was a key strategic priority. They had engaged Studer and created the leg, it had LEMS for each of the leadership team, 10 goals in place for the department managers, quality scores were presented to the board, LEM goals are presented monthly, um, department managers were involved in financial management through the budgets, they were held accountable, each manager had four to six goals outside of the financial, and a group incentive around achieving those goals. Uh, here's this was a hospital. And I just want to share with you this. This this uh, this line right here is your operating margin. So the operating margin deteriorated in 15, 16, 17, to the point it was almost negative 11 percent. CEO was replaced with the new abundance minded CEO, one of my one of my very good friends. Immediately, they improved a new relationship with the medical staff. Uh, and performance improved, and obviously with COVID, but if you just trend line, take out the two COVID um, impact years, and they were back up to almost a 9% uh, positive operating margin and continuing to improve. Worked with the medical staff, um, improved revenue cycle functions, managers were all embudged in the budget, really something else. Here's another one. This was a hospital down in the Southeast where they had a CEO was replaced in 2021. Uh, prior to then, the leadership team that was brought in by the hospital back before 2018 convinced the board that there's no way for this hospital to be profitable. That some um, you know kind of bad debt was pretty high. There's no way it's going to lose, lose, lose. Complete scarcity based leadership team. They brought in the, um, the director of the foundation who was previously COO, but when the new leadership team came, came in, they, 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 they told her that, that she's gonna be now head of the foundation. Uh, she came in immediately, the operating margin improved to 8.4% the first year, first full year that she was, was in place, uh, developed a uh, relationship with the orthopedic group, significantly improved revenue cycle functions, super, super, superstar. And then the last one is one up in the upper of uh, the, the northwestern part of the United States. Uh, the lines I just want to show is is operating revenues blue has maintained above. This is a hospital that is committed to a couple things. One, measurement, complete abundance minded CEO and um, um, committed to community health. They have a 10 bed critical access hospital that was built in 2013. And just three years ago, right before the pandemic, opened a three-story wellness center with a rural health clinic, a, a fitness center, a climbing wall, a community uh, kitchen where they can teach kitchen lessons, um, and um, absolute extraordinary performance where they're, you know, you know, if you're just looking at these numbers, in, in, incredible, but abundance, uh, measurement, et cetera. The, um, so, so really, I just want to wrap up by saying, I look at these, these three in combination, a abundance-based mindset, understanding of what drives contribution margin, and a measurement culture as the three keys to success for our critical access hospitals out there. Um, so I, I, I'm, I've actually passed our time, so I'm getting in trouble by somebody. But um, I, I definitely want to thank everyone for listening in to the, this two days series. And um, I'm supposed to say this, that, um, um, that as you sign off today, there's going to be a pop up. Um, just, just providing feedback would be really appreciated. We want to make sure that these are the best and you're getting the most out of it in the time frame that we've allowed. And so thanks for thanks in advance for just taking a few minutes and a few seconds and filling out that form and appreciate everything you have. I don't know if we have any time for questions, but if anybody wants to throw something in the chat box, I got a minute or two. Look at that, no questions. So with that, 
we're going to give you back your day and um, ha have a great one and the rest of the week. And, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you out on the road soon. Take care. Bye.